This is Mission Control Houston. We're going to be going down to the NEMO 16 mission, which is uh, kicked off and is going to be going on for the next uh, two weeks. Yesterday we were joined by Stan Love. Today we are lucky to be joined by Mike Gernhardt, who is uh, the principal investigator for NEMO 16. So, Mike, thank you so much for joining us. Let's talk about what's going on today down there off the coast of Florida. Okay, so uh, what we're trying to do is jump out into the future, you know, 15 years and understand what it's like at the nuts and bolts level to work on an asteroid. And so we've got three aspects of this mission. One was a robotic precursor that we did months ago to document the um, remote sensing of the, the coral reef in the area of the Aquarius habitat. The second element of that is that we're diving with these deep worker submersibles that are uh, highly maneuverable single piloted submersibles that are the uh, uh, analog of the space exploration vehicle that we're developing under the AES program. And then the third aspect is the saturation crew who are saturated in the Aquarius habitat and they're out investigating different methods of restraint, translation, uh, and different sampling techniques for what it would be like to actually work on an asteroid. And today they're on day two of the EVA only circuit, as we, as we say, we've actually developed an underwater asteroid that's about 500 feet across and there's all these different sampling sites that, that, that we're using consistently with different uh, restraint and translation techniques. Let's talk about translation a little bit. You know, it, it sounds like something that would be so easy here on Earth, but uh, anybody who has watched a space station uh, spacewalk knows that, you know, moving around and figuring out where to put your hands and your feet is, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges of doing a spacewalk. So talk a little bit about how that's different, how is it more challenging on an asteroid, and what are you guys learning in terms of that? Yeah, great question. Um, and I always say, like, asteroid is like the worst combination of lunar and microgravity. Um, <clears throat> on space station, we have complete control over the translation paths. We have handholds. We have all these different restraints, foot restraints, body restraint tethers, and so forth. On an asteroid, we have none of that. And so we're investigating laying out translation lines that we would anchor at one point probably fly the SCV across to another point where we could anchor that line. We're trying to understand how much stability we get out of these translation lines and what kinds of tasks we can do on them. The other thing we're looking at is this thing we invented that we call the lightweight boom. And picture this telescopic boom that we anchor at one end and then you deploy it and then you can anchor the other end and then you can short tether yourself to it or use a body restraint tether and then reach down and do the sampling tasks. And then you can release the anchor at one end and sort of step the boom across the asteroid. Of course, we don't know if we really can anchor to asteroids of different characteristics. And so what we're assessing here is the benefit of these different techniques if we could anchor. And uh, then the third thing that we're looking at with the crew today is use of jet packs. Um, and, and that looks good for certain tasks, but not for other tasks. Later in the mission, we're going to bring the submersibles up and work with the crew, and they'll actually be in foot restraints on the end of an astronaut positioning arm on these submersibles that are the equivalent of the SEV, and then we'll repeat the same circuit with those techniques, and we're collecting all these metrics to understand what the best combination of uh, restraint and translation systems, crew size and distribution, all those kinds of things that will inform a more optimal and cost-effective development of the hardware when we actually go to an asteroid or, or a moon of Mars. So you said the word jetpack, so I have to ask about that. Are we talking about looking at something like what Bruce McCandless used back uh, during that famous shuttle picture? Is it sort of like that or what? Yeah, so it's it's quite a bit will be quite a bit different than the safer jetpacks that we have on space station. We'll have a lot more delta V. It will be sort of a nominal thing versus a contingency thing. Um, we're simulating that underwater with a thruster pack on the on the back of the of the crew members, um, and we're you know we're looking at it today as a jetpack only, and that's probably not totally realistic in the sense that if we didn't have a space exploration vehicle, you would have to go from the deep space have potentially a kilometer or so away to the asteroid and back. And if we have to do that with a jet pack, it becomes something more than a jet pack. It becomes a device that you can do targeted burns and so forth. But what's looking promising from NEMO 15 and the work we've done in our asteroid sim is the combination of this very capable jet pack and the space exploration vehicle 
where astronauts can be on a positioning arm or they can excurt off the vehicle with this jet pack and do some local reconnaissance, maybe pick up what we call a float sample, which is just a rock that's not attached to anything. And then when we have to do the more detailed you know, hammer chip samples or deploy seismic devices or drills and so forth, the SEV would then come in and the crew members would get in the astronaut positioning arm and do the more fine task much the same way we do on station with the SSRMS. You know, we talked to Stan yesterday about what it's like to uh, work in the water and how, how closely that mimics what we would see in space. Well, I want to get your take on it, too. What, what does the water teach us, and how, you know, what are sort of the pros and cons of, of doing it? Yeah, and, and there are pros and cons. The, the, the good thing about water is we can be neutrally buoyant. Uh, we do have the viscosity and the drag of water, which becomes more of a factor the faster you go. So on these very slow, methodical, uh, you know, close-in task. It's actually a pretty good simulation. Uh, and as we know from the neutral buoyancy lab training that we do, it's about as good a integrated choreography simulated environment as we can get, but it's not the only environment. So we actually have within our analog program another simulation of an asteroid where we've integrated that with the virtual reality lab and the jet packs so that we have the proper dynamics of microgravity. And so we kind of always say that each analog is one chapter in the story of how we're going to work on an asteroid. And so we have to do all of these different analogs and then put those chapters together to have the story of, of the path forward to working on an asteroid. So what is ahead for the crew? I mean, this is uh, early on in the NEMO 16 mission. So what are they going to be doing for the rest of this week and next week? And uh, what's ahead for them? So they're doing what we call the EVA-only circuit now, and, and they're evaluating, again, this standard set of tasks across this 500-foot you know, simulated asteroid under different techniques. So they'll be doing that through Friday. And then starting Friday, we bring the submersibles up, and we start doing the same circuit with the divers, saturation diver crew members on the submersibles in different combinations of working with just an astronaut positioning arm and one crew member outside. Another condition we call condition 6B is uh, two astronauts on the submersible or space exploration vehicle. One is on the astronaut positioning the arm, the other is on a jet pack. And then we have another variation where they can go on and off the arm and jet packs and so forth. And, and again, we have very uh, specific metrics by which we evaluate our performance and, and uh, scientific results. And so the, then there'll be like four days of that. There's also some um, other life science uh, sort of uh, habitability psychological experiments that we're doing inside the habitat. And of course, I failed to mention that all of this is being done with a 50 second each way time delay. And that's, one, that's a big difference between anything we've done in space previously and what we're gonna have to do on an asteroid. And by simulating that, we really, get into the nuts and bolts of the best way to manage the operation, to the assimilate the data, one. to do replants and so forth. And, and we're learning tons every day from that. So last question for you, Mike, as somebody who's been in space before, does it, does it get you excited as we get uh, you know, closer and closer? I mean, every time you guys do one of these tests, it puts us that much closer to actually going and flying one of these missions in the future. So what, yeah, how do you feel doing something like that? Yeah, no, I, that's a great question, and it really is exciting because I think we're doing this thing right. We're instead of writing requirements and building hardware for years and years and years, and then and then figuring out how we're going to operate at the nuts and bolts level. You know, our great team has jumped out ahead, and we're trying to understand those operations early enough that we can inform the design of cost-effective hardware. And uh, I'm I'm very optimistic. I, I'm actually. Um, very pleased with what we're learning. You know, if you go back two and a half years, no one had the first clue of how humans were going to operate on an asteroid. <clears throat> now we're talking specific <clears throat> tool designs and operational methods, and it does make it just that much realer. Um, and then I also am optimistic that because of the work we're doing, when we go to develop this hardware, we can do it more cost effectively. And I think we need as an agency to learn how to do that because we have you know, essentially limited funds, and, and we need to go and do exploration with the funds that we have, and this is part of that whole process. Well, Mike Gernhardt, we want to thank you for joining us. It's, uh, it's, it's exciting stuff you guys are doing down there. We're going to keep, uh, keep watching how the team is operating over the next uh, several days down there off the coast of Florida. 
Of course, if you would like to follow along with the NEMO 16 mission or check out some of the webcams that are currently broadcasting from the bottom of the ocean floor, just log on to www.nasa.gov nemo. Once again, www.nasa.gov nemo.